I'm especially pleased to be in the U.S. Every single time I come back to the U.S., not only to breathe the clean air and see the blue sky, but I get to go to Whole Foods, I get to go to Trader Joe's, I get to order stuff off of Amazon, and I go home to my kids and we end up with really full jars of really safe and healthy snack foods. Now, this may look really normal to you, but in China, you know, this is really hard to get, and this is sort of our version of being rich, you know, healthy, safe snack foods. Now, in the last few years, we've been able to, to um, order organic vegetables straight to our door. And so twice a week, we get this delivered to our door, and we even go to the vegetable gardens once in a while in the suburbs of Shanghai with our kids to see where the food is grown. Again, this looks really normal to you, but this is just sort of a new occurrence in the last several years. Um, it makes me feel a little bit better. I'm a little bit a vegetarian by default in China because I'm afraid of the water, I'm afraid of the growth hormones, I'm afraid of um, you know pretty much everything. So I'm <laughs> vegetarian by default. Um, you might have heard of the melamine in our milk. You know, a lot of women go to Hong Kong to import um, uh, powdered milk. You might have heard of sort of exploding watermelons from too much nitrogen fertilizer, etc. These are sort of normal everyday things that we have to deal with. You might have read about the 15,000 pigs floating down the Shanghai River where I live. Um, you, you might have thought, oh, well, wasn't it 3,000? Well, each day it seems to get a lot more. Um, you know, these pigs, I think, have died from a virus, and it was cheaper uh, for the farmers instead of being fined for um, these pigs to just sort of throw them in the river. So the mayor of Joshing right now is seeking help, international help. How can he deal with this, the disposal of these animals. Um, just the other day, I was at Ecolab. They have the third largest R&D center um, in Shanghai. Their largest one is just down the street here. And um, they do water purification. They were testing the tap water. And yes, indeed, there is more higher bacteria count now because of the pigs. Is it going to affect us, our health, in the long term? We don't know. But I certainly wouldn't drink the tap water. Um, we're lucky, though, in Shanghai, actually, because a lot of places in uh, China, you get yellow water, right, straight out of the tap. So, you know, I'm also lucky that I don't live next to a river that looks like this. This is, this is not retouched. This is not photoshopped. Um, this is industrial pollution runoff. But this type of news is so common in China. Um, we sort of just sort of deal with it. So at home, you know, we deal with uh, it by putting water filters. So this is just, you know, our way of adapting to the environment around us. And I think what's happening is, is that in China, at least, the unnormal is becoming the new normal. And we just have to deal with it. We just sort of say, ha, sigh, you know, okay, yet another day. But, you know, we look around and say, well, I wouldn't actually move from Shanghai, at least not until my kids grow up, because it's so convenient. Right downstairs, outside of my door, that's uh, an, uh, one of the unique pedestrian eating streets called Wujianglu in Shanghai. And I get to eat some of the top um, buns called Xinjianbao in Shanghai, right outside my doorstep. Um, at night, it's a really great community of dogs, sort of an informal dog park comes alive. I turn around the corner and I get to eat these really cheap 50 cents vegetarian crepes made by this lovely lady that now knows me. And she sells them out of these old shikimin traditional homes that are preserved right downstairs. Notice the nice uh, water efficient and energy efficient drying mechanism there. This is on the other side of my home, and uh, you can see the Shikimin building is slightly dusted with snow. You also see the landscape, the skyline, dotted with skyscrapers, which is just part of the Shanghai life for me and 22 million people. You also see the sort of construction, the strip of construction. I'm really excited because that's a new subway line. It's a new exit. Now, I already live on top of a subway exit. So I go downstairs and I'm able to go down one end, jump on the maglev, go to the international Pudong Airport, which is how I got here. Or I go the other way and I go straight uh, to the Hongqiao Airport. I go up three escalators and boom, I get to check in. Or I go one more stop and I get to go to the railway station, take five hours high-speed rail to Beijing, and it's really comfortable. So for me, Shanghai is so convenient, it's really hard for me to leave. And this is the maglev that I was talking about. Um, notice it's going 431 kilometers per hour, which is about 260 
seven miles per hour, I believe, which is really, really fast. Um, and it's really cheap. Um, this is the Beijing subway. I didn't have handy a picture of the Shanghai subway. And yes, it gets very, very crowded, but I still prefer to take the subway everywhere rather than get stuck in traffic. This is Beijing traffic. It's not Shanghai traffic. Um, there's a little rivalry going on between Shanghai and Beijing. Um, but, you know, this, this is normal, right? So people commute two hours a day one way. Um, and, you know, there are times that I'm just stuck there for four hours and it, I can't get out, right? This, that's a good day, by the way. This is a bad day, right? So you might have seen recently pictures of smog um, and you're like, is that real? Is it touched with Photoshop? No, this is like not at night. It's not at dusk. It's, it's during the day. So the new, the unnormal is the new normal and we just have to adapt to it. People are just becoming used to it. They're like, well, if, if we don't live in Beijing, if we don't live in Shanghai, where are we gonna move to anyway, right? This is the other side of the, the sort of backyard view and more construction. You may know that China is building the equivalent of a Chicago every year and will be until 2030. McKinsey did a great report called Preparing for an Urban Billion that tells you in 20 years, these 20 years, we're gonna build 50,000 new skyscrapers, right? Where 350 million people are moving into cities or being engulfed by them. Um, we're probably gonna build 170 new mass transit systems, 100 new airports, brand new airports, very convenient, very nice. Come visit in Shanghai. But you see all this construction, well, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of dust, there's a lot of pollution is caused by this. But I look at this and I'm, you know, I don't get really depressed. I'm like, wow, it's gonna be really convenient in two years when this opens up and it's this brand new mixed use, really convenient. Hopefully there's a really high-end organic grocery that opens up there, right? So every day we struggle with this and it might not look pretty, but we know that good change, good progress is coming. And I think that's the general sentiment in China, that change is progress. So uh, this is Beijing again, the smog. Um, no, I only show a couple of the Shanghai pollution picks. So people very commonly wake up and instead of just checking Twitter, which is blocked in China, uh, maybe Weibo or whatever, we check our air quality apps on our iPhone and iPad. So this is two screenshots of Beijing and a particularly bad day. Um, does anybody know what PM 2.5, well, does anybody not know what PM 2.5 is? It, okay, so it's, it's basically particles in the air that are less than 2.5 microns um, or less, and they can basically go into your lungs. It's very bad. Long-term health effects, a lot of people die. Millions of people die from this. The World Health Organization says that a, the safe level threshold is 23, okay? Can anybody read what the part PM 2.5 <laughs> says on the, on the right side there? Let's see, 886. Did, can anybody read what this says? Beyond. Yeah, beyond index. <laughs> so again, the unnormal is becoming the new normal, right? And I'm, I'm sort of laughing at this, but it's, it's, it's not really funny, but what, what can you do? Most of this pollution is being driven by the West, the West desire to consume. And then we create it in our factories in China and we have to power it, mostly through coal, some through hydropower, but it's being shipped from, mainly from the West and the North to the factories. So, you know, this isn't just China polluting for polluting's sake. This is, um, well, this is a normal day, right? I, I unfortunately forgot to bring on the stage something that I was really excited to get on Amazon, which is my lace-covered pollution and N95 mask. I was gonna show you the fashionable pollution mask that I have. Um, this is, you know, this is normal. So, you know, just the other day, I was having a normal dinner conversation with my son, who's nine and a half, almost 10, and he plays soccer a lot. He's a sort of a soccer star, yay, proud mommy. <laughs> I was like, well, Corey, would you be willing to wear a pollution mask when you're playing soccer? And he's like, yeah, I would try it. Yeah. This is an IQ Air filter, okay? There's also other brands. I'm not trying to pimp out the IQ Air brand, but we have five of these in our apartment. And after the, you know, 866 and, and plus 
incident, my husband um, decided to investigate buying more of them for the office and for different bedrooms, and he's, he realized there was a group discount. So he sent out a friends and family email and said, who wants to go in and, with us and get a group discount? So the day before I left to come here, I said, well, so Rob, how many IQ air filters and, and shark filters, et cetera, are you buying exactly? I thought, oh, seven, 10, we can get the group discount, yay. 35. These are like 1,500 bucks each, right? Plus you have to maintain them with filters. But this is how we adapt. So the new normal is unnormal. A lot of people ask me, well, you know, how is, is China, does China care about this tension between environmental uh, protection and economic growth? This is what I picked up at the airport on the way here. This is the cover of Fortune in China. And this little thing that you, oops, sorry. This little thing that you can't read in China is basically saying, you know, can we have economic growth uh, and uh, environmental protection? So yes, it's on the covers of magazines and on the cover of newspapers. It's on the, the tips of Xi Jinping uh, tongue all the time. And what is China doing about it? Well, it is really serious about going green because the air is gray, the tap water is yellow, the rivers are red. You, you saw it yourself. So this is what we call a business plan, or the China's 12 five-year plan. Um, and you can see there's numerical targets for very serious reductions in energy use, in pollution emissions, in water pollution, and in covering our land with more forest. So forest coverage to 21.6%. Those are really, really ambitious numbers up here. Um, they're also doing things on the fly, not just every five years, they set targets, but they do things like, oh, we're going to put 126.6 billion US dollars towards quadrupling the subway system. And it's already pretty good today in China. Um, they say, oh, by 2020, we're going to have 30% of China's new build to be green. And by the way, we're going to put subsidies to it if you meet the green star, two star, the two or three star uh, ratings. So these are really serious. The problem is, is that China also needs then to follow up with the capability building. But the problem is China is starting really from scratch in the last 30 years, learning how to industrialize. It's sort of a, a pimpled teenager, if you will, right? It's got really good intent, it's really smart, it wants to go to Harvard and MIT and you know, uh, be uh, a McKinsey consultant, Goldman Sachs investment banker, whatever, but, but it's, it's got a lot of you know, struggles that it has to go through. You know, so it's really about enforcement, it's about how to actually execute. It's not about lack of intent. In fact, the government has been saying for the last two and a half years, very, very clearly, in fact, we, we train government officials across China through the Communist Party um, HR department's training academies. And Cho ba is the vice minister of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development, and he opened up one of our classes saying, we cannot continue to blindly follow the American lifestyle. Otherwise, China doesn't have enough resources to support it. Neither does the world, even if we import it from all over the world. And we can't have this. This is a Hongqiao airport, domestic airport uh, sign, right? You have a Range Rover with a castle and green lawn and you know horses, etc. I mean, can you imagine us living like this in China? No. So. You know, they're also putting in policies all the time. Three, uh, about four years ago now, um, 2008, one day in July, they banned all free plastic bags in grocery stores. So you have to buy them. You can still get them, but it's a nudge, right? And so, again, I forgot to bring it from uh, the dressing room, but I have a little reusable bag that I bring everywhere. And when I go to the grocery store, I bring like five of them. I, I don't buy plastic bags, and this is just the norm, and it was sort of overnight. This is Xi Jinping's empty plate campaign, okay? This says, say no to waste, right? Change starts with me, right? So th they're pretty serious, right? The government is very serious about going green. They're certainly not doing this. They're certainly not sort of sitting there watching pollution grow and sort of, you know, the world collapse, et cetera, and not doing anything. In fact, I would, I would give, if I were to rate China, I would say it's probably one of the most progressive, if not the most large country, uh, most progressive large country in terms of the amount of investment that they're putting in, in terms of the intent to go green. They just don't really talk about it well outside. 
So um, one of the things that John shared with you is that I'm from MIT, I studied electrical engineering and computer science. You know, I, I, I've been really lucky to hang out with people like Julio Friedman, the chief um, energy technologist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, or um, Ernie Menez, who is now the Secretary of Energy. And what I can tell you is that we should not be waiting for any of these technology people to come up with a magic button. There's no magic button to stop what's happening in the environment. There's no scientific or technology, uh, technical red button that's going to appear that's going to help us within the next 20, 10 to 20 years. But we need to make that change within the next 20 years. So how are we going to do that? Well, you probably have heard this statistic, right? If everybody lives like an American, with an American lifestyle, we need 4.2 Earth. Well, you know, let's round up because there's no such thing as a 0.2 Earth. So five planets. Um, to live if everybody lived like an American. So we can't, we can't do that. What we need to do is decouple the rise in living standards, especially in the developing countries like China and India and Brazil and uh, Indonesia, etc. We need to decouple that living standard rise from the traditional rise in energy use and consumption of resources. So the problem is that China's consuming class now is 470 plus million today, and it's going to grow to 800 million by 2025, according to Helen Wong, uh, who's the author of The Chinese Dream. And what we need to do is give them a set of attainable aspirations that are also sustainable. So if you take a look at this number of the population, the annual per capita income is going to triple by 2020, right? So rise in living standards means rise in energy use. Um, we, you know, again, the government knows this is a disaster for the world if we allow China's per capita emissions to be equal to the U.S. So, bad news. Right now, we're already equal to European per capita emissions. Not good. And we have about mm, four years, four and a half years, to 2017 before people estimate that China's per capita emissions are going to equal the U.S., Okay, remember, there's no magic technical red button to push within that time frame. The good news, I think, is that China is a new country every five years. I've lived there nine, nine years. It's almost two new countries, right? So, and change is progress, right? We're used to change. We embrace change. So there's, there's a chance to show us a different way. We can create a different, better way of life. So if we can't follow the American dream, the, the question that we pose to ourselves now is what kind of dream shall we follow? What is the China dream that we should follow? So instead of just complaining and complaining, what I'd like to do is start talking about solutions and maybe you know, inspire some of you to come help us in China or maybe work on this in the US. We just launched the UK dream a few weeks ago on March 7th in London based on this project. So what we want to do is now reimagine prosperity. We want to reframe sustainability to reshape consumerism. So this is about a co-creation process. It's not about juice and our experts from different academic uh, you know, uh, um, institutions saying this is the life that we should lead. It's not about the government dictating something. It's about doing a whole bunch of co-creation workshops with key opinion leaders from all parts of society. Well, the middle class of society is really who we're trying to target and saying, you know, take local ownership. Um, we are the, just the convener. We're a neutral convener that is bringing people together and then we're curating this to make sure that this new China dream is sustainable. And what we're doing is we're humanizing it. So what we're doing is speaking to the heart and not to the head. We're not educating people to change behavior. We're appealing to their personal motivations. So if you take a look at ncia.com, you'll see an article that I just published uh, a couple weeks ago called Sustainability is Dead, and it talks about this language issue. So now we've taken this methodology that we've um, put together over the last two years, and we've packaged it in something called Dream in a Box. And it's essentially shaping what the dream is, activating these new norms, and then measuring whether or not we've reached the tipping point, whether or not China wants to go in this direction. So this dream in a box can really be applied to different tribes. We happen to be piloting it in China. We, again, launched the UK dream with a different organization like Juice, who's the neutral convener, the neutral curator. We're also working with brand companies with, uh, like Unilever, 
that can leverage their own brands to activate these social norms. But it can also be applied to non-nation states, right, or non-companies. It could be applied to a culture like a Latino dream. Why not? So in the first step, framing it, what we've done is ask people, what does the better quality of life look to you? By bringing in cultural experts who know China and our traditions, um, storytellers. So for the first time, I think one of, we've really taken, um, for, for the first time in an environmental initiative, we've really sought out the top of the top advertising agencies. So uh, the chief knowledge officer of Ogilvy Asia Pacific, Kunal Sinha, um, Julian Bora of Thin Air Factory, who was from Saatchi and Saatchi S, Edelman CEO in uh, China, et cetera, et cetera. And we bring them together with people who understand sustainability. And we curate these key opinion leaders in these types of workshops, from London to Shanghai to Beijing. We're doing one in Guangzhou next week. And uh, this is Tongji University on our city. What does a better life mean in our city? This is Ogilvy Shanghai on health and wellness. Um, and you know, th these are people like the sustainability head in China for Unilever, to a nutritionist, to advertising agencies, to journalists, et cetera. Bringing them together. This is an art museum talking about culture and style. So then what we want to do is give voice to this dream. We want to see what words can we use that are not sort of uh, wonky words, right? So instead of sustainability jargon, what we want to do is say, what are the words that appeal to personal prosperity and cultural identity? So we, we want to appeal to emotions because emotion leads to action. Reason leads to conclusion, and we want action. So language, let's start with language. What does the better quality of life mean to you? Now, in China, what we've done is we've taken the word sustainability and we've replaced it with the words harmonious, happy, or he yue in Chinese. And we take a look at these three areas and we basically ask people to put post-it notes and create wordles. Um, and we sort of play around with this. Uh, this is a Chinese wordle. Um, in the UK, they're experimenting with something called a granopedia. So phrases like waste not, want not, make do and mend, things like that. So um, John was saying, uh, a, a, a priest was telling him, look, if it doesn't appear in the Bible or a poem, you shouldn't use that word, mm -hmm. right? That's a good point. Um, we do a lot of these ideation drawings, like what is the dream to you? What is the nightmare to you? So now what we want to do is visualize it. So what I'm going to show you right now is where we're at with what the China dream is. We're just now about to activate this. So China Dream, He Yue Meng Shang, is basically working together to create a better quality of life for us and our children. Now, hopefully this resonates with you, but it does seem very opposite of where America is today, which is very sort of more individualistic dream, and it's more about conspicuous consumption versus quality of life. In harmonious communities, this can almost be a real estate ad, right? So instead of integrated uh, uh, transport or transit-oriented design, eco-cities, we're saying we want convenient metro-centered living, dense vertical on top of a subway. We want access to space, not ownership of space. We want an extended community support network, like free delivery service or my um, domestic health, uh, medical uh, support, etc. very convenient in a city. In culture and style, we want equal access to quality education and job opportunity. We want things like buying shared experiences versus buying things. We want refreshed traditions. We want to go back to our way of life and say, what can we refresh that's sustainable and bring it, restore it for um, modern uh, relevance? Sophistication and etiquette is really about courtesy and respect, which is really a sustainable value. It's thinking beyond yourself. Safe food, air, and water, really this slide should be number one, I think, because this is the number one concern. That's why I started the talk with it. Um, balance, this is a very Chinese concept. Uh, vibrant elderly living, we have an aging demographic. Or mentally sharp kids so we can pass that college entrance exam. Right? Fulfilling relationships, we have a sort of 50% divorce rate. We have 55 million kids left behind in villages being taken care of by their grandparents while their parents go to two different cities and work. So these are things that really resonate with Chinese today. Notice I didn't use any technical sustainability jargon. They're, they're all implicitly sustainable, though. So now what we want to do is forge this. We want to activate these social norms. How do we do that? How do we tell the story through people? 
So again, what we're doing is convening different stakeholders, whether it's brand campaigns, government policies, advocates, um, well-known advocates, local communities, media channels. We're bringing them together to say, how can we activate social norms and leverage your platform? So what we want to do is take this dream in a box. We want to let other people do their own China Dream workshops locally and all feed back into sort of what the China Dream movement is all about. Here we have somebody from Tsinghua University, sort of the Harvard of, of China, and she's saying, I commit to holding a China Dream workshop in our campus. Here we have somebody who works at Brookings Institution and also runs the Jingtai Art Museum for his dad. Um, here we have somebody at Edelman, China, who um, manages the entertainment department for China. So then what we want to do is hold classes so that students can debate and explore more deeply what is the China dream. So we've held two classes already last semester at Tongji University. We're going to hold another one next fall. At Shanghai Jiao Tong University, we're going to also hold what is China dream class next fall. So, you know, we're starting to um, explore different channels now. But ultimately, we need to leverage big channels like social media. So what we want to do is create a gallery with Chinese captions um, on the Chinese version of Pinterest called Huaban and allow this to then create social media viral memes that the top social media advocates can say, what is my China dream? We're also bringing in advocates like Mr. City 2.0, who's a professor at Tongji University. Um, the CEO of Edelman is our Mr. Healthy CEO. Um, I'm a public service mommy. So what we're doing is we're going through press, massive mass media like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, um, um, Elle, etc. And, and then what we're doing is we're humanizing, we're peopling the China dream. How do people actually live the China dream? Who are the heroes? How do they live the China dream? Who are the villains that are not living the China dream? And then what we want to do is bring it to life in soap operas. So we now have a large company who's going to work with us to bring a new soap opera to life, a big one, next year, which I'm really excited about. This is really how you start shaping social norms. If you look at Will and Grace here in the US, if you look at Grey's Anatomy with AIDS, um, there's soap operas that um, in Mexico that were very influential in contraceptives use. Um, and then what we are doing is we're, we're bringing in people who are really excited and want to do something in their own silo. So here, Andrew Wong of Arc Design designed this street cart to allow people to refill fast-moving consumer goods like shampoo or laundry detergent. So it would be great to work with a company to actually bring this um, alive in China. Augmentum, the software developer in Shanghai, is just now launching the beta version this weekend with me in front of 40 Chinese mayors and international mayors, something called He Yue, the Harmonious Happy City application, both on the web and mobile, where what you can do is you can say, this is what I see, right, algae, this is what I wish we could have. And then you can get people to build on the idea and then bring it to the local government. Another one that we just incubated at Davos and has got a lot of traction and one of the projects that I'm here to seek support on is a new way to eat. And so the concept is, can we eat in a way that's good for you, nutritious, in a way that's good for the planet, sustainable, and is culturally attractive? So what we want to do is pilot this in China because as we have 800 million middle class starting to eat more meat or beef specifically that creates more methane and eats more corn and uses more water, this is not good, okay? Well, it's an understatement of the night. Um, so how do we optimize nutrition per calorie? How do we optimize nutrition per acre? How do we integrate traditional Chinese medicine concepts so it resonates with the Chinese um, population and creates better eating habits? So what we want to do is activate this through school curriculum. We have a pilot school. Uh, school meals. We want to bring in the sort of the Jamie Oliver concept. My family happens to be in the restaurant business, so we have a lot of connections to different chefs. We want to work with people like Marks and Spencer or Walmart or people who do private label foods to then push smart food for smart kids or energy food for office workers. We want to create new policies in China. We want to create a mobile app so people can understand, okay, seasonally what kind of foods I should be eating, locally what kind of foods should I be eating. Another big platform is 
the brands. I mentioned them before that we're working with them. Well, what we want to do is integrate sustainability into the mainstream marketing campaigns, working with the chief marketing officers. So our key message there is, is that there's many ways that companies can help shape the China dream in society. You don't have to just offer green products and services. That's not always possible. But what you can do is through your advertising and marketing campaigns, shape new social norms in the background and not show large green lawns and castles and horses. And what you can do is you can create customer experiences that enable China dream harmonious values. So activating social norms, I showed you one half, which is aspirational. How do you shape the, what, the image of social norms of, of aspiration? But we also need at the same time to create policies. So sort of hard power, soft power simultaneously. So I talked to you about the banning of the free plastic bags. Well, we're also doing research on other nudges, like what if you bring your own cup to Starbucks, which they, they're already experimenting with this. You get money back, right? So why not just make this a policy? Green public procurement, why not make that into policies? So one of the advantages that JUICE has as an organization is that because we train 40 to 50 mayors and central government officials at a time in mandatory training classes on sustainable urbanization, um, we actually have access to people who can put these policies into place. This happens to be um, the former deputy mayor of London, Nikki Gavron, talking about the climate action plan for, for London. So measuring the dream, a lot of people say, well, how do you know when you're successful? Well, it's really about when juice is no longer needed as the catalyst, as the curator, but people know um, that the China dream, when we say what is that? What, what is it visually? Um, so we're going to measure it in the number of people reached, how many times the term Hoyue has appeared, how many workshops have been held, how many brands have put this into their marketing campaigns, the impact of specific projects, some of which I showed you today, and then the number of policy pilots that we're going to implement. So these are some of the ways that we're going to be measuring how successful we are. The key message that I'd like to leave you with, and I think I've way shot over my time, is, is that we, this is a message of scale. China is very difficult to understand the true scale of what's happening in China. You can read about it, but every single person lands in China and say, well, well, I knew about it intellectually, but until I saw it, it's really hard to viscerally understand how big this problem is. So how do you get scale? Well, we need innovation, which I think a lot of the institutions are doing a great job. We need more people doing it here in the US. But we also need better collaboration, and I don't think we're doing that well enough here. We're not teaching it, really, in the US. And so I was really glad to hear about um, Kate's program, Boreas, specifically focused on creating collaborative leadership. I also think you need to be a little OCD and have a love of efficiency, right? A lot of these problems, like pigs floating down the river, are about inefficiency in the system. Oh, I forgot to tell you my pig joke. Does anybody want to hear a pig joke? <laughs> Okay, how could I forget my pig joke? Um, so the Beijing guy sticks his uh, head out the window, takes a deep breath and says, wow, I'm really lucky. I get to have a free cigarette every five minutes. And the Shanghai guy says, that's nothing. I just turn on the tap water and I get free pork rib soup. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm, I'm done. Yes, that was it. So, uh, so what I would like, the message that I'd like to leave with you is, you know, to be a true change maker, you need to, to think about all these four things. And it's not just good enough to be a scientist and really understand the data. You have to be able to communicate it to different audiences and bring them together. You need to be really OCD about throughput. You know, again, computer science major. Um, and and under, understand what are the big, big drivers of change. Don't just work on the small small, tiny projects, because frankly, China, what's happening in China is going to flatten all of that if we don't fix China. So just briefly, we launched two years ago something that was incubated out of JUICE and now is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader initiative called Stone Soup Global Leadership. And this is basically our attempt to take this collaboration methodology that we've um, learned about and experimented with and, and say, how do you actually teach this? So the thesis is that there's certain types of people that are very good at being natural stone soup leaders is based on the fable of stone soup. And you know they like to bring people together. They're sort of an idealist or practical optimist, not an idealist, not a pessimist either. And 
they maybe have worked in different sectors or speak different languages or lived in different places. And so they're very flexible. They can see different points of view. And then they have different skills. What we normally call soft skills need to become the hard skills. We we'd loosely categorize them as engage, envision, enable, and energize. So this is really about telling a good story, bringing people together in win-win opportunities, keeping the momentum of a movement up until it reaches a tipping point. And this is all about catalyzing change through collaboration. So I, you know, a lot of people ask me, why do I do this? You know, why am I, I'm literally volunteering my time, 10 years of my life, to Jews, dedicating 24-7, uh, traveling all around the world to, to try and make change right now when it's most needed. Because I can't stand the thought of doing this, right? Just watching the world sort of blow up. Um, and it sort of reminds me of just a week ago, I had this amazing Skype call. You know, I'm a big, heavy Skype user. I will pimp out Skype. Um, but I got this amazing Skype call from a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in a few years. And it was really moving because two and a half years ago, she had a stroke. And she now has locked-in syndrome. So she had to blink out the questions to me through an assistant on the side. And I had stayed in the hospital with her and I had tried to do this. It's actually very difficult. It's like, you know, all she can do is lift her eye to communicate. She's, per I mean, she went to Stanford and Harvard. She's like venture, you know, huge investor, successful, etc. She can totally think clearly, but it's very difficult for her now to communicate. And I was just thinking, wow, you know, she's trying so hard to rehabil rehabilitate herself um, she's trying so hard to reach out and live a life. You know, who, who is it for me to, to rest one? Sorry. I want to dedicate this speech to my friend Lori. You know, what I, th I think it's just, if I can, I must. So I hope that you will join me. If you can, please do, okay? Thank you.